By the end of this interview, he's written on a lot of franchises that we know and love. And with me today, I have someone who's helping me out for the very first time. Um, and I'm going to let him introduce himself so you know who the other voice is on the line. That is not our uh, main author guest. Huh. Hi there. Hi. So uh, why don't you tell listeners who you are and uh, what show you're from? Sure. Uh, my name is Jacob Tender. I am a host of the Star Wars podcast, Bantha Fodder. Um, I co-host that with my friend Mike Comite, and uh, it's probably not too unlike yours. And uh, Bantha Fodder is a good place for <laughs> Bantha Fodder. No, you know. Yeah. No, we no we do a lot of we do a lot of Bantha Fodder talk. <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm assuming by the time this airs, you'll also be watching Rogue One. I won't be. Yep. I'll be. Yeah. Uh, no. I'll be watching it on the Tuesday, but that's just money stuff. But. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I got early. opening day tickets, so I'm excited for that. <laughs> so this is all recorded early. That's why if there's anything that like happens in the next week that changes things, like Rogue One doesn't come out, um, it'll we'll all look sound kind of silly. <laughs> well, that's the curse of podcasting. I feel like any time I talk about something on a podcast, you, you know, it generally uh, changes within the next four or five days, well, or yeah. even before I get the episode out, which is always a drag. We're going to be calling in our author in just a minute, folks. Uh, the author who we're going to have today is William C. Dietz, who you probably know because he wrote the Kyle Katarn story, um, the books for the Jedi Knight uh, Dark Forces series. He's also written in Mass Effect. He's written in StarCraft. He's written in Halo, as well as a lot of original military fiction. So we'll be calling him in in just a second. But, uh, you know, as a, as a fellow podcaster, you know, I'm quite sure we've all had the the moments where – you know, you record something early, and you're like, okay, this is going to be out in two weeks so I can get ahead, and then you mm -hmm. put it out, and just before then, something happens that makes it all obsolete, and it sounds really silly. Happens all the time. More often, you know, I have a, I have a music podcast as well, and I think it happens more so with that than with the, the film stuff, but yeah, it's it's just something you got to contend with. Yeah, it's one thing that we like to do here. We like to make it more timeless. Like, you know, we interview, like, composers and stuff, but, like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really focus on what's happening now versus their whole career so that people can go back and it's still interesting. Because I think mm -hmm. one of our biggest examples is we had, um, uh, what was it named? Chris Friedman? Is that his name? No, he's a writer for Clone Wars on, and he was talking about how they wrote stuff for after season five of the Clone Wars and how they couldn't talk about it because, you know, they don't know what's going on. And mm -hmm. then, like, the day before the interview came out, they released that they're going to release the Lost Mission. <laughs> oh, no. And then, like, people were like, what is this? He says, when did you record this? Like, a year ago? I'm like, last no. week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, all that uh, PR mumbo jumbo, you got to kind of, you got to walk around. You got to be careful. You don't want to slip anything up. <laughs> so I'm going to add uh, Mr. Deets to the call right now because he is ready to go. Hey, can you uh, can you hear us? I can. <clears throat> Excellent. So I am Jeremiah, host of Bombay Radio, and I have with me the host of the Bantha Fodder po uh, podcast, Jacob, who is the other voice you'll hear in this call. Hi there. Hey, Jacob. Glad to uh, meet you. Glad to meet you as well. Welcome to the show. And, uh, you know, I guess one thing I just really want to start off right off the bat. I grew up in in Alaska, where there's a lot of military people. Uh, a lot of my friends went in the military. A lot of my family went in the military. And uh, you're one that went in the military. And I, it seems because of it, is that why a lot of your books are military fiction and so on? So why don't you talk a little bit how your military background uh, affected your writing, as well as the fantastic story that you have, you know, how you went in the military and then became a writer um, partially because of it. Okay, great. Well, uh, I think I had an interest in military things as a, as a boy. I like to read books about um, military, you know, things, battles, heroes, that kind of stuff. I was attracted to uh, that kind of adventure story. And I think of myself as um, somebody who writes entertainment. And that was the kind of entertainment that I was attracted to. And um you know, as I have said in other interviews and, and online and so on, I was not the best student that ever came down the uh, the pike. Uh, I didn't uh, really apply myself in uh, school the way I should have. And so when I finished high school, I didn't have a whole lot of options. I didn't have uh, the grades to get into college. I didn't have the money to get into college, even if I'd had the grades. And um, I didn't want to, you know, uh, 
live with my mother and, and basically uh, uh, use her. I wanted to support myself. And so the only option I really had uh, was to uh, join the service. And uh, there's a Navy tradition in my family. And so that was the first place I went. But um, although I wasn't, you know, completely smart about a lot of things back then, I did have this one uh, what turned out to be good idea. And that was I wanted to get some kind of training that I might be able to use when I got out of the service. So I, uh, I was interested in things medical. And uh, so I thought, hey, medic, you know, you can uh, do that in the service, get out, go to work for a hospital. And I had this vague notion that somehow I would work my way through college later on. And of course, it was no more focused than that. Uh, and um, long story short, I was accepted in the Navy and uh, given medical training, became a medic. And because the Marine Corps uses Navy medics, I got to serve with both the Navy and the Marine Corps. And now, long way around to the answer to your question, I had a chance to really sample both cultures, to live in both kinds of organizations with both traditions. And uh, I learned a lot from it. It straightened me out. It gave me an opportunity to grow up. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I also am still uh, kind of um, profiting from that experience in terms of my understanding of military culture and affairs. And it's and it's definitely evident. I actually powered through one of your books the uh, the other day. I read uh, Heaven's Devils, your your StarCraft II tie-in novel, and it's really uh -huh. evident that you have a lot of experience military-wise because there's the there's the vernacular and the way people talk and the way people interact and the way a battle is set up. That is really evident when someone you know approaches it from a real life experience military side versus a how they view the military side and it's really evident in your writing especially in that book that i just went through which is uh heaven's devils well thank you i'm glad to hear that so um you know there's there's a lot of different directions that, that we want to come from and i think one that we're going to start with because there's a lot of listeners that are curious about this um is how media tie-ins um work with you know games with uh movies and so on and you've written a lot of uh video game tie-in novels and so here's a, a listener wants to know um what is it you know this listener says so i've been approached to potentially write a book for an upcoming release that i can't talk about but i was wondering what's an example with your work or with the people you've worked with with the writers guild of a game or company that supports you really well when you're writing uh a tie-in novel for them what is what sort of thing should i expect or hope to get when I'm writing a tie-in novel from the company to make it the best work possible? Well, I think the most important thing that you would uh, try to get would be access to the creative team. Um, no matter what company you're working with, the, you know, the folks that are actually writing the game and, and uh, creating it are in many ways your customer. I mean, you may think of the company as your customer, but in all truth, if you can't sell what you're doing, to that team, uh, it's not going to go well for you. Um, so uh, the best thing that you, if you could, you would ideally sit down face to face with that team. Now, I've been able to do that on a few occasions. For example, when I wrote Halo the Flood, which was a novelization of a game, meaning rather than writing a, a story that's sideways from the game, you're actually taking the game and turning it into a book. And because um, at that time, Bungie was located uh, about 50 miles away from me, I was able to actually set up meetings and go there and sit down, meet the folks face to face, hear their thoughts, pitch my ideas and interact with them. So that's, that's the best of all possible worlds. If that's not possible, the second thing I would go for would be um, to have good conference calls where you get as many of those people on the uh, phone as you can. You try to find out who they are and what they're thinking and so forth. The problem with this is, is that it calls for really good interpersonal communication skills. You have to, as a writer, really have the ability to listen to what's being said, to interpret it correctly, to understand there's politics at the other end, to realize that you're really talking to uh, a team of people, each of whom has their own agenda, 
their own kind of uh, piece of the work that they're most interested in. And somehow you've got to work with all of them to uh, get where you're trying to go, which is a good book. Okay. Um, this is this is one that a, that a listener really wants to know that uh, – well, I guess I'm just going to bring it up. You know, there was some controversy recently, uh, fairly recently, I guess. Time flies. I'm sorry. I have three. I have little kids, and so my my time in my head just flies away. <laughs> um, you know, recently there was there was a controversy. You talk about writing with the creators and so on, and how that leads to a good relationship. You know, and I know clearly with Resistance, you did that because you also helped write the game. Um, Halo. You said you worked well with that one, and from what I can tell, it looks like StarCraft really worked well um, as far as as far as that goes. It gelled really well with a lot of the StarCraft books and games that I've I've gone through. And so I'm just wondering, since this was, you know, fairly controversial, when you were writing, say, the the Mass Effect novel, did they give you that type of connection that you would have preferred as far as writing it? Or did they just say, write this book, Drew Carpitian's no longer writing this series, good luck? Well, some of each. I mean, I would say that, um, you know, I, I, I would not criticize the amount of um, <clears throat> input they gave me. I mean, I think in many ways it was about Typical. It wasn't. It wasn't as close as some of the different uh, um, opportunities I've had. And you've, you know, we've talked about a couple, Halo, and and um, and we talked about um, StarCraft. Both of those were were times when I got to actually sit down with the team. Uh, I did not get to sit down with um, with the Mass Effect uh, folks. I think you know the reason that that book turned out to be controversial and something. That isn't, you know, necessarily apparent to readers, um, you know, was to that, um, you know, and this is something about writing tie-ins is, is that often at the front end, you're given some objectives, things that they want to accomplish with the book. If it's part of an ongoing story and it's, uh, you know, advancing an overall arc of, um, of things, then, um, you know, then they, they say, look, we, we would like you to get to this somewhere in the book. And on that, in that particular book, one of the assignments I had was to, you know, basically kill off uh, a character that a lot of people really cared about. So, you know, when you do that, um, you know, you're sort of pulling the trigger potentially on a lot of, um, a lot of controversy and that's what, that's what flowed out of it. <laughs> yeah. And that, I think one thing I can take positive out of the, out of that out of that book is at least you know the fans really care about the material. Like <laughs> it's I, it's kind of, I don't know for me it seems like it would be kind of fun to write a series that you know the fans really care about um, because I don't know as an author I, I I think that getting input would be it's it's nice to know that people actually read it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, did, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, even with the controversy and even with the fact that you know some people did not like. Uh, both the plot and the way I wrote the book, um, you know, it was still a bestseller. Yes, it was. And did this book come out before or after Mass Effect 3? Sorry, not a huge Mass Effect fan. Just want to get the timeline straight. Uh, I'm, you know, it's been quite a, it's been years since I have okay. uh, looked at that. I mean, at the time it was current. I'm trying to remember if there was another book after it. Uh, there's uh, no book after it yet. Uh, okay. The current the, 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 there's ones they're writing right now for the new game, but I believe okay. it came out right after Mass Effect, uh, right, right after Mass Effect Three. Yeah, I okay. think. We'll see, I, I think that was a ripe time for controversy. I mean, and maybe it was just bad timing because at the time, I remember a lot of people being really upset with Mass Effect Three. I've never played the game myself, but I was working for a marketing company in California, and my job was to handle the social channels for that game. So essentially, I was responding to the tweets and the Facebook posts, a lot of which were very negative in connotation towards the way that that game ended. So I think you know, at, at the time, like it, like you say, Jeremiah, the the fans of that series are, are very passionate and well, I could uh, totally see that then. And I could see how maybe uh, that could, you know, follow up with your book. Yeah. I, I, you know, those are good observations. And I think, you know, Drew had just left their team to go and do other things. Um, I, I don't know Drew personally, but I mean, I, I was aware that that was the case and I think you're right. I think that there was, um, you know, a setting and, um, and just some, you know, latent unhappiness, um, you know, there. And boy, I mean, they they were unhappy, believe me. <laughs> I, got, uh, I got flamed, uh, you know, for quite a while. And I think the company, you know, 
came away from that whole experience, they got flamed as well. Everybody involved was, you know, uh, attacked, and uh, and I mean really attacked personally and and so on. And so I think the 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 company um, really it was funny. The fans, you know, they cared very very much about the story, the characters, the universe, and then through the way that they reacted to the game and to the book, they kind of destroyed, at least momentarily, the very thing that they love. Um, because the, I think the company lost interest. They're people. You know, that's the thing mm -hmm. that folks forget. And I, and since you've been in in the business and close to these things, you understand what I mean. Um, they've got other things they can do. So if you make the process of creating a, a storyline and a game unpleasant enough, um, you know, they may just turn their interest uh, to something else and then boom, the very thing that you're all upset about, you don't get any more of, which is sort exactly. of... Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a great observation. You know, I don't really think about that, but I mean, you you see that all the time. Some you know, a game or a movie comes out and it kind of yeah. goes away for a while. I mean, the heck that that happened with Star Wars. You put out three movies that people didn't really like that much, and you didn't really see a whole lot of Star Wars for a long time thereafter. Well, and and you know, you just raised an excellent example. I mean, I think that Lucas's feelings were really hurt. He's a person, yeah. human being, and and the kind of criticism that is heaped on people these days. Uh, I, I mean, I, I just think it, it really took him down. And um, and people, <laughs> you know, I mean, sure, the guy is uh, whatever he is, a billionaire, and he's all these things. But, you know, he is the guy who invented that wonderful universe. I wrote mm -hmm. three tie-ins for Lucasfilms and uh, had a chance to go down and talk to their team, another example of where you can get face-to-face. And uh, I mean, what a wonderful, wonderful invention! I've uh, I've already got my reservations in for Rogue One, Christmas week, and I'm looking forward to it. And so, speaking of those tie-in novels, you wrote the Dark Forces um, trilogy, which you're in a very unique place right now with Rogue One coming out. This essentially retells part of the story that was told in those Dark Forces games. And in your novellas, and then, and of course, several other comics and books that didn't always agree. But you know, you you essentially wrote part of this story um, with the original EU versions in the in the nineties. Um, of course, your ones were some of the ones books that some people forget exist because they were the Dark Horse Comics publications. But how does it feel to you as a writer of Dark Forces being able to see now a, I guess, a definitive movie version of these events that you got to write back in the day, and now you get to see what Lucasfilm decides to do with that story. Um, you know, I guess your perspective will be really interesting on this movie. Well, I, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm thrilled. Um, I, I just think it's great. You know, it's one of those things where if you get to work in that universe, it's almost like, uh, you know, well, it's a privilege. And um, I remember when I, uh, when I got the deal with Lucasfilms to write the first of what turned out to be three novella length, fully illustrated uh, hardcovers. And I was talking to Steve Perry, who you may be familiar with, another yep. well-known science fiction author, you know, and he had already done something for uh, Lucasfilms and everything. And I said, so tell me, Steve, what, you know, what, what should I be most concerned about here? And he said, just don't be the guy to screw up the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, and I understood immediately, and I understand now what he was talking about. You just didn't want to be the man or the woman who, you know, messed it up. You wanted it to succeed. And so to, to get back to your question, um, I feel like the continuity here, the the fact that a movie is being made and, and incorporates some of the elements of that time and that and that side branch of the story, I mean, that's, that's like proof that we didn't screw it up and uh, – that you know it had value and so on. I mean, it it was incredibly fun to do. And while I was doing it, by the way, I was working full time as a uh, marketing communications manager for a large telecom company. So that was going on at night after I put in an eight hour day, and it was going on on a rented computer because I didn't even own one that was capable of uh, you know doing what they wanted. Wow. So, you know, the character that was introduced in your books and in the games that they're based from, 
is extremely popular, as you've probably noticed. Carol Katarn is extremely popular um, mm-hmm. among fans. And I imagine with Rogue One coming out that you've probably, I don't, I don't know if they contacted you, but there's been a lot of push for people going, is Carol Katarn going to be in the series now? Is this or that? Is Disney going to use Carol mm-hmm. Katarn? Did you ever feel this kind of a possessiveness of this character or protectiveness that you like, you either wanted to see him on the movie or you didn't want to see him at all used because you wanted to see them do something different and not change the character that you wrote? Well, I, I take pride, obviously, in Kyle and, and um, you know, and, and care greatly about him. But I also have uh, been able to maintain some distance here. This takes us back to the nature of tie-in work. You know, when you sign up for any tie-in, you know, activity, you have to realize that uh, this belongs to your client, not to you, and that uh, you're really doing work for hire. So if they say kill off a character or if they say create a new character or whatever they may, you know, give you and that you've then contractually agreed to, you need to be ready intellectually and emotionally to deal with that. So I'm a realist. I understand that that these things shift and that things evolve and so on. Uh, So I won't be upset um, no matter what they do. I just think it's incredibly cool. The president's kind of been set there for a character to be pulled out of the EU, though. I mean, look, we've got we've got a uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn now, yeah, who's making his way into the TV shows. I think that's pretty neat. Yeah, it is. It shows they haven't completely forgotten about the Legends titles. No, no, they haven't, and that that really is that's wonderful. I imagine as a writer, you know, like any of these characters that you were able to write, you know, be it Carl Katarn or you know these these villains that you have in the, in your three books, imagine even if any of them were brought up that were influenced or, you know, the, the, they, they took, uh, they, they took part of this character and made it a new character. I imagine that would be something that you would just, you'd probably just love it. Wouldn't you just to see that, you know, show up in rebels or someone saying, this is from this book. Enjoy this, this nod to this character that, that you got to write. That would be incredibly rewarding. Definitely. I mean, that would, uh, that would be fun. Again, if you can leave your mark in some small way on that, on the whole Star Wars universe, then that's just like a, a very cool accomplishment. It's something that feels good. And, uh, and you never know. Everything is, everything we do these days in entertainment, um, is, you know, is shared to some extent. Everything influences everything else. And so sometimes, you know, the, the ripples in the pond, so to speak, are not entirely visible to you because you're not privy to, everything that's going on, but you'll see something and you'll think, ah, oh, I wonder, you know, did that come from what I did? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. That's probably as close to attribution as you're often going to get. So I'm curious about this one because this series, you know, as I said, it gets overlooked by some people because it's not the, I guess back then it was Bantam and now it's, uh, it's Delray Random House and so on that publishes these books. Is there a difference writing for Dark Horse Comics, writing a novella for Dark Horse Comics and there is say for, for Del Rey and so on. Like what what are the different like things they ask for, being that it's a very different publisher than these other giant publishing houses? Well, in terms of the literary part of it, not too much difference because um even in the case of Dark Horse, it was being filtered through it was actually it was a three way deal between um what is now Penguin Publishing, Dark Horse and Lucas Films. And my editor, uh, from a literary perspective, um, was uh, my editor at Penguin, Ginger Buchanan, who is well known in the science fiction world, very famous editor and, uh, and a great, great person. Uh, and then I had another editor, which made it more interesting, um, down at Lucas Films, who was also controlling the content and, and everything. And her, and that was Lucy Autry Wilson who is also a very, very well-known figure in, in, sci- in Star Wars circles and so on. And she was really um, the gatekeeper for all that was going on. Dark Horse, uh, their role in the whole thing was more related to the art. Now, what makes those three books really, really extraordinary, at least in my mind, is, the, um, is not only, I hope, good stories, but the incredible quality of the art. Uh, these are full page illustrations, you know, color illustrations. And, um, what was one of the, uh, mo- you know, finest moments in my life, most enjoyable moments, I should say, was being invited down to the ranch 
uh, north of San Francisco, uh, you know, to get together with not only Lucy, folks from Lucas Films, my editor from New York, but the artists who did those paintings. As I recall, there was three of them, and they were great. And so imagine this wonderful, you know, opportunity to sit down. I had kind of penciled out outlines for the books and my my notes and to talk to these artists about the kind of art they were going to produce. And I mean, it was just, it was a, like a kind of jam session, you know, with me saying, well, what if I did this, you know, and, and then, you know, an artist going, oh my God, I can see it's like this huge tree that grows up out of the plain and so on and so forth. I mean, that was just, I mean, that, that was worth doing it. They didn't even have to pay me, but they did pay me. And that was good. And one of the artists for the final one was Dave Dorman, who's like a legend among among <clears throat> Star Wars comics and Star Wars art in general. And he got to do the art for uh, Jedi Knight, the third one in the series, which which is just awesome. Because yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dave was there, and he was part of that jam session, if that's the right word for it. And uh, and it was just an honor to meet him. And I've run into him a, a couple of times since at conventions. I haven't seen him in many years now, but. Uh, Totally great guy. All three just amazingly talented. And uh, and like I say, uh, those three books I, I am so incredibly, you know, proud of because of the just the literary quality, the art, everything in them. And, and that's where I want to come back to Dark Horse Comics. They get credit for the packaging, for pulling all of that art together and the overall look, the choice of the paper. I mean, nobody worries about paper with books anymore, but the paper for those books was carefully chosen. Everything about those books is just like, you know, high class, high end literary publication. And also, this is one of the very few publications, and I think it might be the only book itself, because the rest are comics, that actually got a radio drama adaptation, because John Whitman did the Dark Forces trilogy as a radio drama with Highbridge Audio. Uh, we also did uh, what, uh, Dark Empire and Crimson Empire, but these are the only books that got a full-on audio drama with John Whitman and that team, and that's you know that way they live on to even more mediums, because there's the game, there's the books, and now there's the audio drama, so people can listen to it, read it, and enjoy the, the pictures, and it's just, it's one of the full experiences that you can have uh, across Star Wars. We have everything for your stories. You know, uh, you you mentioned that, and it's interesting because um, the way I found about found out about that was not from anybody at Lucas Films or Dark Horse or anywhere. I I think I read about it in Entertainment Magazine or somewhere like that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, it blew my mind. I mean, uh, and that's how it is in this business. I mean, it. You, nobody necessarily tells you anything about what's going on just because you wrote a tie-in. You know, tie-in, tie-ins, and tie-in authors are seen as just kind of like bricklayers. You know, I mean, nobody goes back to a bricklayer and says, "Oh, by the way, you know, we're adding on to your building now." And God, what a great job you did back in the day! And you know, congratulations. Such <laughs> that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. Uh, when those books came out, one other thing, though, related to your comment is, is that. Um, it, uh, they were immediately made into audiobooks. That's so common now. Like, you know, almost every book that comes out through a major publisher is automatically made into an audiobook. But back then, um, they were few and far between and they were, you know, produced on uh, CDs and that kind of stuff. And uh, so it, uh, it got a little bit of play that way as well. I love that. I love hearing uh, all these stories about authors working with with Lucasfilm back in the day because yeah I, I'm very obsessed with following the the current story group in, at Lucasfilm it's a very tight-knit group of people that essentially get to decide the entire future of Star Wars of course with the uh, authors and writers that they're working with for the TV shows and the books um, but you know speaking speaking to that um, you know what was what was the experience like working with Lucasfilm as far as the story development goes was were they fact checking with other novels like how did that work at that point in the late 90s? Oh, wow. You know, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, computers were a little newer then. I mean, it seems completely ridiculous to be talking about that. But uh, I told you I rented a computer to work on that project. And um, because the one I had just wasn't up to the task. And mm -hmm. uh, so the way that you would receive the Bible, all of the background information, everything, 
market thing was still on paper for the most part. Um, and um, the other way that you would get the information is, you know, all of those uh, different tie-in uh, Lucasfilms, uh, tie-in books, you know, where they would have the diagrams or every spaceship that ever appeared in a Star Wars movie or or it'd be a compilation of all the different aliens or, you know, all of those books that used to, you used to find them at Barnes and Noble, you know, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they would send you a box of those books because all of those books and the material in them, um, those illustrated uh, books had been approved. So they would say, all right, you know, you can uh, use these books as reference. And I mean, literally, I got cardboard boxes shipped to me full of those books and I would use them if I needed to look, see what a particular destroyer look like or something like that I could go into those books and probably find a you know an image of it that would help me uh, describe it uh, as far as the outline of the story goes um, basically uh, as is often the case in tie-ins that was largely up to me I mean I would pitch something I would say look mm -hmm. here's my idea I think we should do a B C and D and then um, Lucy would come back and say, you know, well, I, I see a problem here with this. I see a problem with that. Uh, or this individual would never do that. Or this is a conflict with, you know, whatever. Uh, and then I would modify what I was doing, resubmit it. And we'd go through that process maybe three or four times until I got an outline together that, that she was happy with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then the next step would be you'd write a rough draft and, and uh, refine it and then turn that in and she would give you feedback and you'd react to that and turn it in and so forth until you had a final product. Did you ever find that frustrating as compared to writing your own original works where you could fully create the characters and everything that they're about? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that when you're in the moment and, you know, you you thought that something you wrote was just incredibly, wonderfully perfect. And then mm -hmm. somebody tells you, no, you can't do that. Uh, either because a they didn't like it or b it doesn't fit with something. There's a moment of frustration and right. and you go yeah dang give me a break you know. But then <laughs> uh, as I said earlier, you have to come into it as a professional and you have to realize that it is tie-in work. You did agree to take the money and to do what they wanted you to do, and mm -hmm. um, you got to you got to stay in that headspace. And I think for the most part, I was able to do so and. Uh, and just remind myself, dude, you're writing a Star Wars book. Uh, <laughs> you know. Exactly. It's cool. You know, Did you ever yeah, save exactly. any of those pieces for your original books, like the parts that wasn't going to fly within the, you know, the tie-in? No, it, you know, it's never a fit. It would, you know, if you try to uh, try to sew some of that onto something else, it would be so clearly, you know, wrong. So mm -hmm. no, I, I never have. So you know, you've. You know, you've written in a lot of other people's universes with all these tie-in novels, you know, even even Hitman you've done books in. But so wh why don't we compare writing in other people's universes to the universe you created with, uh, with uh, the McCade universe where you, you know, wanted to create your own sprawling universe with all these different things. What was it like with your very first novel, I believe, started in the McCade universe, forming your own universe um, as opposed to all these other ones that you got to work with? Uh, what are the challenges that you faced creating all these uh, from Galactic Bounty, Alien Bounty, and so on, all these interlocking books and forming a consistent universe on your own? Well, just, you know, first, just some quick background. You know, uh, I had always um, thought that I wanted to be a writer and that I wanted to write a book, but I didn't do anything about it for a long time. I had this weird notion in my mind that, that, uh, that you know, I had to write a book by the time I was um, – you know, 40, I set that, that date for myself. But I was busy living my life, and I had a corporate job, and I had a family and kids, and I didn't have the, the time. And I got to be 39. I hadn't started that, that book that I'd promised myself to write. And I said, oh, my God, you gotta you got to write it now if you're ever going to write it. And my goal was to simply write it, um, you send it in, get rejected, throw it in a drawer, and forget it, because I, I knew that that was what the odds were. And so to answer your question, as I started writing that book on a typewriter, by the way, um, you know, the, the immediate challenge was just learning how to write, teaching myself the basics, um, stuff like, oh, my God, is this going to be he commented? 
he said, he replied, he wondered, you know, I mean, what, how do you do that? And, um, you know, so that, so a lot of my effort was spent just simply trying to get the mechanics of the whole thing down. But I had this vision uh, that, you know, I, I love bounty hunters. When I was a kid, I liked to watch uh, Westerns that had bounty hunters. And I thought somebody should do like a bounty hunter in space. And um, that's where the Sam McCade concept came from. But I didn't want it to be, you know, like a, a misogynistic bounty hunter. I wanted this guy to be a little bit more of a modern man. So you notice that one of the things in the Sam McCain novels is, is that he, um, he has a relationship with a woman. Uh, he gets married in the first book or soon after the first book, and they stay together over a number of books. He, I didn't kill her off so he could have another lover uh, or any of that. And, um, and I wanted to show her as a complete person, as somebody who, um, you know, could have adventures of her own and was a strong character and was competent and all of those things. Maybe I was influenced by the fact that I have, you know, a wonderful uh, wife and, and two strong daughters. And, you know, so maybe, um, maybe that was in there somewhere. But um, anyway, everything that I have written since is in that first book. In other words, everything I like and care about, and in no particular order, military, aliens, cyborgs, shapeshifters, man-woman relationships, uh, you know, treachery, villains, on and on and on. Er, you know, all of the elements that I care about, I put in that book. And I really haven't added any elements since. All of my books, you know, um, some focus in very carefully on, you know, just one or more aspects of that, but I'm still not running out of things to do. But anyway, I assumed that that would be my only book, that there would never be any more books, so I tried to cram it all in there. And uh, I sent it in, and um, I won't bore you with the story, but it basically uh, sold the first place I sent it the first time I sent it in. Wow, that's that's really rare. And so that was the beginning of a 30-year relationship with Penguin and with Ace. Once you sell one book, you can more easily sell more, and I did. And uh, and the most obvious place to go was, um, you know, a sequel and, and then uh, use that universe to do side novels, like, say, Prison Planet is set in the McCade universe, but not about McCade, even though his spaceship appears in the story. So, you know, you have done several giant series um, and universes and worked in other people's universes. Uh, do you ever find it uh, easier to take a break and write just a standalone novel as something separate? Or do you prefer writing in a universe that either you created or someone else created that you can tie in stuff with because it's established? Well, I think there's um, there are um, pleasures in uh, writing a standalone novel, sometimes referred to as a singleton in the business. But the business of publishing um, is not really set up to let you do a whole lot of that. Um, the business really uh, exerts a, a real strong pull towards at least duologies, meaning two books or trilogies, which we're all used to, for really uh, largely commercial reasons. You know, I mean, publishers um, believe, rightly or wrongly, that um, – that trilogies sell. Now, the real numbers, when you look at them, show that most trilogies, the first volume sells a lot more than the second, which sells uh, more than the third. But publishers persist in thinking that, uh, that trilogies are a good thing. And I will admit this, that when they take off, they, they can do extremely well. So that's one aspect to it. I tend to write duologies and trilogies because uh, my publisher wants me to, and because there's a financial incentive to do that. But the other reason that you write a duology or a trilogy, and that's the case right now, my latest book that came out um, uh, two months ago uh, called End of the Guns is part of a trilogy called America Rising. And the story for America Rising, which is sort of a post-apocalyptic alternate history military book, if you will, the story is so big that, that I couldn't really get it done in one book. I mean, it would be a doorstop if you tried. So that's where it's really nice to have 
three books to tell the story over, each book having its own standalone story, mind you, but having an overall arc that is much larger. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. And, you know, not not it's, it's like why I don't read books, say, like Atlas Shrugged. It's really big. <laughs> and as a student with kids, it's like, well, I'll read it in like seven years. <laughs> it, yeah, well. <laughs> breaking yeah. it up is very useful because it makes it so the, as you said, it, tie, it keeps you tied in. And if you're invested, you're going to stay for all three. And if you're not invested, well, then you have one instead of, you know, a giant book that you never finish. And at least you'll finish the one. And it, it it's, I don't know, it works for me. And I grew up in a house with a ton of books. And, uh, you know, it's it, it's it's nice when they break it up that way. Yeah, yeah, and I I agree with you. And as an author, like I say, it 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 can be a bit trying that that they always want that. But then on the other hand, when you have the big story, it's wonderful to have that larger canvas. So you know, I'm I'm wondering. You wrote the Legion series, which is very big. There's twelve books in that series, but you also wrote the tie-in video game for it, um, Legion of the Dan. I just want to know since you wrote this twelve book series. What is the difference when you have to condense it or take elements of that series and make it into a game? What was it like writing an iPhone game of your series? Um, what were the challenges for you, uh, and what did you find you know easier or harder for it? Well, that was my first shot at writing a game. You know, later after that, um, Sony hired me to write um, uh, Resistance: Burning Skies because I'd written two two resistance books. So later on, I got to build on that experience. But getting back to your question, it, it's like the first time you do anything. It's a learning experience. And the um, it was a very small, you know, uh, uh, sort of boutique company, Offworld Games, that hired me to, um, or didn't hire me, but bought the rights to the Legion um, uh, series to turn into a game, and uh, they chose, they felt the best thing was to focus in on the first novel uh, for their their game, and so we did that. That was good in a way because it narrowed the focus of, you know, what I was trying to do. And, it, and as with all things having to do with games, you know, it was a team thing. They said, well, here are the elements from your book that we like the best, you know. Here's the 10 things that we absolutely want to get in there, and here's kind of how the mechanics of this are going to work. And you know, it's a it's a game for iOS devices, and um, you know, there's certain things at that time that could be done, and certain things that could not be done, and so we were somewhat constrained by that. And um, they were a very small company, as I already indicated, and there was uh, financial constraints on art and on voiceovers and all of that, too, that we had to keep in mind. So uh, the task then came down to writing um, the game uh, within those parameters, remembering that the way games work is that the, the narration and the dialogue is mainly in the cutscenes or, you know, in between the the levels of the game is where that stuff comes in, little short pops of dialogue and, and interaction. And then the player is back into the game uh, and that dialogue and everything goes away until the next cutscene. So um, uh, it was really a matter of writing those breaks and then uh, getting input from the, uh, from the rest of the team. And, uh, and, and of course being very familiar with the story and the characters, uh, I didn't have too much difficulty, but what blew my mind was that they knew these books sometimes better than I did. I mean, they mm -hmm. they could pull dialogue out of book five or book six or whatever, and uh, they just astounded me. What uh, so that was that felt good, obviously. So you know, with usually with with this type of experience, it seems like it would either be harder because you're you're basically you know cutting down your baby, or it's easier because you know it so well. So for you, it was actually easier to be able to condense down your book into into a game form, uh, a, a game form like this, you just found it an easier experience? Yeah, I think that's true. Okay, so then we're going to compare this with, for writing Resistance, uh, which was for the Vita. You know, you wrote Resistance tie-in novels um, for the, the Sony game series. Um, for writing a, a Vita game, you know, this is different than writing an iPhone game because it's, it's more robust. They can do more with it. Um, so what sort of stuff did you learn from the first time writing Legion of the Damned in 2011 to writing Resistance for the Vita the next year? 
Well, you know, a couple of things around that experience. First of all, I want to give credit to Mike Bates. I had a co-writer, and his name was uh, Mike Bates, and he worked for the company that Sony had, desired, had um, hired to uh, do um, the uh, Sony uh, Vita game. So, I, I, you know, kudos to him. Um, I think that uh, Mike and I were um, a great team in a way in that he had certainly more script writing experience than I uh, did. And, you know, you, as, as I'm sure you two know, you know, writing a script is different from writing a book. It's different in format. It's really uh, calls for uh, a different perspective as you come to it, almost a different kind of writing talent. It's different enough that I think you could say that. So I was learning from Mike as I was doing that, but Mike was learning from me because by that time I was so steeped in those books and the universe and the culture and all of that, that I think I knew, you know, maybe more about some of those things than he did. Maybe he would disagree. I don't know. Mike, if you're listening, um, you know, <laughs> you can object, but I think we were a good team in, in that regard. Um, so, you know, uh, but certainly that first experience to answer your question with Legion helped me because I understood the mindset and then I'd, I had worked with other teams like the Halo team and, and so on, and I knew how important it was to uh, get the interpersonal communications down and so on. Uh, what you begin to understand as you get into actually writing a game like that is how important the people who uh, lead each level are. You know, typically levels are, are, are like individual efforts done by a little mini team, all of which goes together to make the game. And each uh, level manager, uh, for lack of a better um, descriptor, uh, has his or her own, you know, little kingdom that they're trying to further. So, you know, they're very jealous. They don't want you to give all the good stuff to some other level. They want the good stuff in their level. So, um, you know, when it comes to the big, big boss, um, you know, a boss in gaming uh, jargon being like a big monster, you know, the big monster that always appears somewhere in the game. And then there's there's lesser, you know, lesser monsters and, and all of that. They want the big boss, you know, in, in their level and so on. So, you know, it's not the point I'm trying to make is it's not just the writing of the words. It's the working with the team and all of the politics and all of that. I see. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, this is this is actually this is really fascinating because knowing um, also when you're writing a game, you have the the unique privilege of if you choose to uh, seeing the game played or seeing how it all ends up because you know there's lots of people that work on the game. You know, there's the writers and there's the developers, there's the voice actors and so on. Did you get to see how this game came together, like in its final product, either play it or see it played? And what did you think of when? the voices are all put in there, the performances are put in there, and the developing team worked around your story and you worked your story around them. How did how did you like the final results and what was it like seeing for Legion or Resistance or both your work put um put in motion that way that in a way that you don't usually see as a writer? Well I was it was a thrill to see it because, you know, it's like it's like seeing uh, something that you've worked really hard on be born. You're you're proud of that, and and um, and you're thrilled to see it. And and I I don't go there often, but probably every three or four months I'll go into the into that particular game on Amazon and see how many reviews, positive reviews there are, and how it's doing. And the last time I looked, it was doing very well, and I was you know I was pleased to see that, and and uh, so I I felt I felt very proud of it. But, you know, as you see the final product, too, it's just natural if you're a creative person to think, uh, you know, I think it came out really well, but boy, I wish you would have let me do this or let me do that because, you know, I just think that, that my way, or in this case, our way, since oftentimes Mike and I would agree and wish we could do something that they wouldn't let us do or they, you know, didn't agree with or whatever. Uh, that's the creative process. You know, anytime you do something, I guess I learned that from being a television director. You know, I used to direct the evening news in Seattle and, and, you know, TV is a team exercise. And so it kind of prepares you to work as a team and creative endeavors. And, um, and you're, you're never fully, fully satisfied because uh, something could always be better. And yet you can still be very proud of the product.
Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So when writing resistance, for example, was it a, a, a set of compromises between you, the writers, and the developers, or did the developers always have the upper hand and the writers had to work around them? What sort of relationship was that? Um, what was it a give and take on both sides, or is it one side kind of wins and you have to work around it? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's complicated. It's very dynamic. I mean, you've got a producer, you know, person, the head of the company that was hired to put out the game, definitely swung a big hammer and uh, would, uh, you know, come in and tell Mike and I, no, you know, you're not going to do that. No, we don't like that. No, you you know, and, and we'd be disappointed. Uh, on the other hand, the producer from Sony, who was over, you know, superior to, if you will, the guy who was running the company, that individual would come in and say, hey, I like what you're doing. That's looking good. <laughs> and conflicts. Sony outranked the company, so sometimes that would win. But then Sony also was, this, this guy who represented Sony was sensitive to the fact that, hey, you know, you can't just cram this down people's throats. You know, it has to be a consensus because it is a creative exercise. So he wouldn't just simply, you know, uh, green light everything that we did, but but he would often be an advocate for us. And then we would be an advocate for ourselves. But I was at a little bit of a disadvantage in that, you know, I was working uh, here in Washington State, whereas the activity was taking place in California. Mike was on um, on scene there, but I wasn't on scene. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't access the, um, you know, the, the, the conversations that take place in the hallways and stuff where oftentimes things get done. That, that makes a lot, that makes a lot of sense. And it, you know, it ties in well with the, you know, the, the tie in novels where the, the better experience in general seems to be when you can meet with them in person and see them in person and have that face to face hands on, uh, experience versus distance. Distance always creates some risks because it's, 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 it's distance. You don't have right. as much communication. But the one of the things, you know, that you run into is that if you can't, you know, if you can't work it out with the team, you're, you know, you begin to have problems. I mean, in the case of resistance, um, the, the sideways books that I wrote, I had, these were not novelizations. So they were parallel stories. And, um, you know, and I had to come up with the plot. I mean, the plots weren't handed to me, to me, and and they rarely are handed off to tie-in writers. So, I had to come up with a story and um, and then pitch it to the team. And um, you know, and and when you pitch these things to the team, remember that they eat, drink, and sleep this. I mean, this is their whole lives for the moment. They work long days. They care very much about it and everything. And there is kind of like a group mind that develops with the team. So, you know, you pitch some, you know, plot and you say, I want, you know, I see this character who may be a minor character in the game, but I want to blow him up, make him more of a thing over here sideways from the game and so on. And then I want him to do this and do that. And then they, they'll they give you a response like, oh, Bill, dude, you know, like uh, he just would never do that. And then I go, why not? Well, he just wouldn't do it. We know that he wouldn't do it. Well, how do you know that? I mean, I'm, I don't, where is that material that supports that he would never do this well we just know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know i mean you have to get over and around that kind of stuff and um you have to you have to be a good uh you know a good listener and a good talker and a and a good uh uh you know conference call player <laughs> to to get uh, a lot of this stuff done but it's it's still fun do you ever miss that committee or conference um, setting for or or uh, style when writing your own books, or do you find it more of a relief that you don't have to answer to other people? Because I imagine having a committee can sometimes help you with ideas when you're stuck, but can also hurt you when it's when you don't like it. When you don't. Yeah, like it. no. I I think the simple answer to that is no. I can't remember sitting here in my office going, "Dang, I wish I had a committee." <laughs> <laughs> So who do you bounce ideas off of when, when you're writing? Do you bounce ideas off your wife or your family? No, not really. Um, you know, my wife is um, <clears throat> a huge help to me in that she um, always does a first edit on my books, whether they be tie-in or, um, you know, my own original work. But she does it from a very um, technical perspective of, you know, 
um, you know, finding all the typos, finding the stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know, there was a gun on the table four pages ago and it disappeared. Where did it go? You know, um, uh, you know, she's not a science fiction fan, uh, doesn't read science fiction or fantasy. And so, you know, uh, if I try to pitch ideas to her, I just get a blank look like, what? <laughs> You're going to do what? What are we talking about? Um, so, no, I really uh, I really don't. Um, you know, eventually when you turn the book in, you get feedback from your editor who reads mm -hmm. the book and and then um, hopefully has intelligent things to say. Not always, but usually. <laughs> so we're going to begin wrapping this up because we're almost out of time. But um, uh, Jacob, I believe you have some some questions left before I uh, before I wrap this up. Yeah, you mentioned that you're you're interested in seeing Rogue One. Obviously, I am too. I've got some tickets for the opening night, and I know Jeremiah has some tickets for for one of the first few days there after the weekend. And uh, I, I'm just curious as to whether or not you're reading any of the new canon novels. I have not had a chance to, you know, but I want to. Um, I've just been jammed up with work. One of the real mm -hmm. ironies of being a, a full time writer is that writing takes so much time that, you know, you get to the end of the day, um, you tend to sit down and have a beer and watch TV or something because you've been writing yeah. and reading all day long. But I'm going to get there. Okay, cool. Are, is there any interest on your part in returning to the Star Wars universe and, and writing another book? Absolutely. I would never say no to the Star Wars universe. Um, Fantastic. But I, but again, I don't know that they would ever say yes to me. They've yeah. got lots and lots and lots of people to write for them. But, but I would definitely yeah. uh, listen if they ever approached me. You bet. Awesome. That's cool. I was, I was, I was kind of interested in asking you about pitching. You know, because obviously, um, yeah, I someday I would love to write a Star Wars book. That's one of my my goals someday. But it, you know, it sounds like you had a, a pretty lucky time with your first pitch, and I know that every pitch after that is generally easier if you have you know some work to to reference or for them to reference upon to see, see okay he knows what he's doing he he, he writes well let's see what he's got um, so that it's kind of interesting to hear I'm I would love to see another book from you and I I love that they are opening it up to more people to come in and create you know Star Wars story I love where. Everything's one, so one, one, one comment, and that is, is that I've never, ever pitched a tie-in book. Oh, really? Uh, no, I've always been approached. Oh, and that's typically, nice. Yeah, typically, and this is a little bit depressing for those uh, like yourself that would like to just sort of break in that way. Um, typically, that's how it works. Um, you know, there'll be some chain of events, like in the case of Star Wars, um, the way it worked was is that the companies came together first, uh, Penguin, Lucasfilms, and Dark Horse, uh, and uh, said, well, let's do something, and blah, blah, blah. They came up with a deal, and then they said to Penguin, so who have you got in your stable of authors who could write this kind of book? Mm, and then yeah. Penguin came to me and said, would you be interested? Um, and and in all the other cases, it's either been that kind of a strange workaround or a deal where, you know, uh, they just simply came to my agent. That was the case with, um, you know, with the StarCraft book. They, they came through Simon Schuster to my agent and said, you know, Bill's done all these tie-ins. We'd like to hire him. And, and we did a deal. That's interesting. Just looking at my shelf now, I have all the canon novels lined up, and you see a lot of familiar names. Uh, you know, James Lucino, he's written quite a few books for Star Wars over the years. John Jackson Miller, obviously, but there's a lot of new ones as well. I'm, I'm kind of excited to see, you know, Chuck Wendig. He had sort of a popular story where he actually tweeted about wanting to write a Star Wars book with absolutely no, you know, inkling of the, you know, any idea that he would actually have the chance to do so. And exactly a year later, he had his first Star Wars book published. So it's, it's cool. Kind of a cool story. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I, I'm glad to hear it. I mean, I think that's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I'm not against um, that kind of thing. I'm for uh, people being able to get into it from all directions. Um, all I was trying to indicate was that I had never personally pitched one and gotten uh, a book that way. Most definitely. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up, but the, you know, we need to get to your um, final question. Is going to be about your book that just came out in October, I believe, is when it came out. Um, so uh, why don't you tell people about a little more about Into the Guns, which you've mentioned, um, and I know it's available on Amazon, Audible, Barnes & Noble. Basically, if books are sold there in large quantities, they're going to have it. So why don't you tell people about your uh, your newest novel and uh, 
where it came from and you know just a little bit about it so people can go and there's still time to buy it for Christmas. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, well, basically, as I think I said earlier, you know, if you're looking for those publishing tags that apply to a book, this one is near future, post-apocalyptic. In other words, it takes place after massive meteor strikes on Earth. It's military because the the uh, one of the two main characters is a, is a female military officer. Um, it's already indicated, you know, it's near future because it takes place um, sometime probably within the next, you know, couple of years. Um, it uh, has to do with basically um, destruction of a great deal of Earth's surface, um, the after effects of that, um, a second civil war in the United States and an effort to put the country back together. The second major character is uh, President of the United States, who, when the story starts, is really Secretary of Energy, and and everybody between the uh, president down to him and the uh, in the uh, chain of succession is killed. And so, much to his surprise, he winds up as president, totally unprepared for that. Um, over the long, you know, arc of the story, there is a relationship between him and the female military officer. Uh, lots of action and adventure. Um, I try to, I see myself as being in the entertainment business, not the literary business. Um, and so I try to be entertaining. It's got a little bit of a political perspective. I get trolled a little bit about that. Um, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it, it tends, folks who are extremely conservative uh, tend to send me negative messages. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but the book is doing well. It's selling well, and um, and you can measure that by I think the numbers on Amazon are you know are reasonably low, low being a good thing. Down in the you know seventeen eighteen thousand, which isn't bad. Uh, it's been holding up well over time. The second book, which is um, um, uh, Seek and Destroy, is actually driving pretty good numbers too, and it's not out until June. Uh, so that's always a good sign. We we're talking about trilogies earlier, and that's one of the things that you know you can say. Well, if um, if the second volume is is pre-selling off the first volume, that's generally a good sign. So anyway, um, you know, it's good strong female characters for our you know female uh, readers, and um, but uh, lots of military action, lots of um, of intrigue and daring do. And, you know, if you want something to just sit back and enjoy, um, I think it might be the one. And who did your cover? Because I love the cover for Into the Guns. It looks it looks awesome. You know, I I need to find out because I agree with you and I've had a lot of positive uh, feedback. Usually I know the artist when they do, um, you know, a um, you know, a person like on my Andromeda books. I, you know, I really uh, got to know the artist and so on. But I do not know the artist's name, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I will find out. But I agree with you. That cover is really helping to sell a book. Now, that's a great example of uh, of that, and a great decision by Penguin not to just put a pretty face on the cover, but to go in a different direction. Yeah, it's you know the way the flag is and the the tank. It it, it looks fantastic, and I love it. It's definitely. Yeah, that, that's something I could buy as a poster and put it up because it, it, it looks that good. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you. So, Not that I deserve any credit. <laughs> so this last thing, uh, if people want to find more of your stuff, uh, ask you maybe more questions or see uh, other stuff about your, your books or re upcoming releases, uh, where should they go? Well, they can uh, look me up on Facebook, uh, and or they can go to my website, williamcdeets.com, and uh, they'll find that there's a an email address there for contacts, and um, I I return every email I ever get from a fan. So um, if they want to interact with me, I'm I'm there. I'm here. Fantastic. And thank you so much for being on and letting us ask your questions. And uh, this has been fantastic. Anything else you, you feel like you need to ask Jacob before we, we let him go? No, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. And I, I look forward to reading more of your books in the future. I actually ordered uh, Into the Guns, which I've been told I can't get it till Christmas because my wife intercepted the package.
<laughs> That's great. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day. Absolutely. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye. Thank you.